All right, we got a talk here on weaponizing hypervisors by Ollie and Dan. Uh, and we have a little tradition here uh, at DEF CON for those that are new to speaking at DEF CON. And do, do, does anybody know what that, uh, what that is? <laughs> so this is called shoot the noob um, and uh, you know those of you who can cheer them on as we uh, do our shot here for the first time speakers. Hey guys, thank you for coming. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, it's our first time as you saw. Um, I'm Ali Islam. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Newman. Uh, I've been in the cybersecurity industry from last uh, 13 plus years. And for a long time I, I was working for a company called FireEye. It's another cybersecurity company. So um, that's yeah. Dan, you wanna hey guys, uh, my name is Dan Regalado. Um, I'm so excited to be here because you know it's the first time in DEF CON so so glad and, and blessed. Y quiero agradecer a mi esposa, a mis hermanos, a los amigos, a esa banda mexicana que está aquí señores. <laughs> DEF CON speaks Spanish. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. So here's a quick uh, overview of like uh, how we organize our talk. So we're going to introduce some some of the basic concepts. Uh, these concepts are really important uh, and kind of a foundation upon which we build our uh, later detection cases and, and you know other policies. Uh, apart from that, uh, then we're going to explain the embedded whole embedded environment, the journey, you know, setting up the board and uh, the environment that we play in. And then we're going to talk about the very important uh, VMI on ARM. Uh, I'll explain shortly what VMI is. And uh, finally, we'll discuss about uh, different attacks, uh, use cases, and some of the recommendations. Uh, okay. So, uh, why is hypervisor so important and relevant? Uh, as you can see, uh, all of the major players automotive grade Linux, Renaissance, uh, Denso, and Alibaba, NXP, uh, Perom Robotics, uh, you, I mean, there, there are many, uh, Green Hill, Intel, they are all have now the hypervisor in their architecture. And, uh, the traditional use case for hypervisor is basically the efficient utilization of the resources and, uh, probably the isolation use case. Uh, however, um, not many people have explored hypervisor uh, for security in terms of, uh, you know, how you can use hypervisor to build a really good security system. Uh, isolation is there, but not the VMI, uh, that we're gonna talk about. Okay, so, uh, w the beauty of hypervisor is that it exposes, uh, an interface which is called, uh, you know, the introspection interface. It's also called virtual machine introspection. What it does, uh, or it allows you to do is, um, you can, monitor the whole system from the outside. Uh, that's really powerful and uh, we haven't seen many people using it, especially on the arm. Um, so, you know, we were very, very excited to start on it and it was a long, very hard journey because uh, there's not much out there. There are like few projects or papers out there. Um, so, traditionally the antivirus, we all know that it has a lot of issues, it sucks. Um, but mainly, uh, you know, when the, any advanced malware comes into the system, uh, the first thing, uh, it does is, uh, basically check if there is an agent inside or if some, somehow it's being monitored. And, um, uh, if you're sitting outside of the printing system, you solve that very important problem automatically. So you, so basically you have that sophisticated invisibility. Uh, apart from that, uh, not having anything inside the operating system also helps with, uh, you know, uh, different certifications because you're not messing up with the device functionality. Imagine, you know, you're securing a car infotainment and then, you know, certainly, you know, there's a bug in your software which kind of messes up everything, right? So you don't want that. Okay, so let's get started on the, uh, on the VMI. Um, what is, 
what is VMI or what, what kind of uh, interface hypervisor exposed? Basically, what you have is raw memory. And uh, you take the raw memory and you use some of the OS specific knowledge to actually make sense out of it. For example, you, you should really know like where kernel is storing what and, um, and then uh, you know, you kind of like build your logic around it to really make sense out of it. For example, if you, if you uh, take the raw memory and you know where the uh, Linux task list is, is stored in the memory, you can go to those offsets and then you can start decoding and you know, finally, as you can see here, uh, you can uh, decode this task list and traverse this task list from the uh, raw memory. Uh, to give you an example, uh, for example, if you have to read a kernel symbol value from the raw memory, you know, it looks like a simple thing if you are inside the operating system. However, from a VMI, uh, it's a very complex uh, process. So what will happen is, um, first of all, uh, you know, once you say, hey, you know, I, re I want to read the va uh, value of this virtual address, first of all, VMI uh, by the way, we are using uh, libvmi. Uh, we highly recommend. Uh, it's an open source project. It kind of provides the basic functionality uh, that you need, and on top of that, we build our own functionality. Some of the basic functionality might be like the, you know, uh, I'll explain you shortly. Like once this is done, for example, the caching and and some of those uh, capabilities. So uh, we really recommend using libvmi. So what will happen? Uh, let's say if you have to read the value. Uh, you'll get the virtual address. LibVMI will first uh, go and check with the system map uh, to see, uh, you know, where the virtual address is, and then um, uh, take that and then uh, map it to the page directory. Uh, the page directory will uh, be added to the some of the bytes from the virtual address to map to the page table, and finally to the actual physical location in the memory and then it will come back and give that value back to the VMI application. So that's the, that's the general flow of how, uh, you know, you can uh, get the value, value out. Uh, also, uh, here you can see that once you go through this process, you're not going to do that again for this particular uh, virtual address. So that's where, again, libvmi comes in. It has a very efficient caching mechanism. You can do on your own also, but you know, in case you want to avoid some of that work, you can uh, just simply use the libvmi. Okay, another very important uh, concept that is critical to, uh, you know, what, what we're going to show you today is single stepping. Uh, because we're going to show you eventually how you can uh, get the system calls out uh, by staying outside of the operating system through VMI and from the raw memory. So I'm sure you have uh, all used uh, debuggers and single stepping in your own use cases, including reversing. However, uh, there, 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 there are other uh, single stepping and breakpoint mechanisms that I want to quickly touch on. The hardware breakpoints is basically uh, uh, are mainly used for code that sits in the ROM. Uh, so basically, uh, when the code is not in the RAM, you cannot override the breakpoint instruction. So what you do is uh, you have these uh, special registers provided by ARM and Intel. For example, on Intel it's D0 to D3. Um, and you store those uh, locations, memory location values in those registers. And then uh, when program counter uh, comes to that particular memory location or that instruction, it just halts the execution and then you can al analyze the whole system. Uh, another is the software breakpoints, uh, you know, is the most common one. CPU assisted that we use in debuggers. Uh, for example, you will set the trap flag in the E flags register and then you'll uh, uh, let the CPU do the work. Uh, once the breakpoint hits, the CPU automatically do the single stepping. But what really is single stepping? Uh, you know, when we single step, what happens in the back end? Uh, so in the back end, what happens is there is a special instruction, uh, for example, called int1. Um, when the breakpoint hits, you know, you, you do the whole analysis. However, in the back end, uh, that instruction, uh, the CPU makes sure that it also executes the original instruction and then move on and then move on. So that's very important. Uh, now the third one is the software breakpoints with no CPU assistance. So we're going to use that uh, in our implementation and there are reasons for that uh, that I will explain you once we are done with the basic concepts. But ju just keep that 
the concept, the single stepping concept in your mind. Um, apart from that, uh, in our implementation, as I said, right, you are playing with the live raw memory. So you really need to know how the kernel internals uh, and how the kernel is, you know, organizing the memory and how everything is uh, working inside. So you have, you need to have that uh, basic knowledge. So uh, we all know that um, from quite some time we now have the paging, the virtual addressing uh, since 286 where the real, real addressing mode ended. Um, and then this is a typical uh, two level uh, paging. We also call it SLAT, second level address translation or you know the, uh, and, and it is implemented using the extending page table and the virtualization ext uh, extensions that the newer architectures provide nowadays. Uh, so to quickly uh, follow the flow, um, like I was saying, for example, if you are going to read a value, this is how it looks like. So basically you take the first 10 bytes, uh, add it to the CR3. CR3 is a special register which stores the base of the page directory and you add that um, 10 bytes to the CR3 and then uh, it takes you to the base of the page table entry and where uh, then you again pick the next 10 bytes and then you add them to get to the right page table and finally you add the 12, uh, 12 bytes which are the offset into a specific memory page uh, from which then you fetch the value. Okay. This is a, uh, this is a, another view of just what I, I just uh, explained. Uh, so two levels of translation. First from a uh, virtual machine to the VM physical, uh, vir VM virtual to VM physical address and then from VM physical to machine physical. So basically you have this hardware on, uh, running right on top of the, by the way we are talking about the bare metal, the type 1 hypervisor, right? So, so you have this uh, hardware, the hypervisor is sitting right on top of it and then, you know, there are, there are like different domains or the VMs. Um, so the second level of translation is uh, handled by uh, a table called extended page tables and there is a pointer EPT. Uh, for example, Zen hypervisor stores that uh, per VM and it is used to uh, do the translation. Uh, EPT, there is something very interesting about EPT. So what EPT, as you guys can see, what EPT is doing is it is eventually giving you the value from the memory, right? It, it points to the eventual physical location where the, where the value is. And uh, the newer uh, virtualization extensions, um, uh, for example, Intel and ARM, uh, they have, um, a way where you can store multiple EPT uh, pointers uh, per VM. Now that is very powerful uh, because one, you can, uh, for a, each page table there are permissions, right? So you can assign different permissions to it and uh, uh, that way, you know, for example, if you assign, if you assign permission execute to one page and then read write to another page, you know, you can play with those permissions. Uh, and I'm going to show you um, later in the in our talk uh, some of the use cases. Uh, but for now, I think it's very uh, critical to you know what we're going to do, uh, or what we have implemented in our implementation. The second um, uh, interesting fact about EPT is like you can, as I said, you can store more EPT pointers so apart from uh, partition. What you can do is you can actually point a EPT to a different memory location. Now what that means is basically for example if you are, um, you have to translate one virtual address, right? Uh, you can play with that last level of translation and then, you know, at one time you are uh, giving one value, at the other time you are giving another value. So basically you are using the same code, you are creating two different behaviors uh, which is very powerful um, and there are many use cases for it. And uh, you can see the code snippet in the Zen where it stores the, and, and the permissions also. Uh, yeah, that's the one I was talking about. Like, for example, uh, the second EPT is actually pointing to uh, another uh, memory location. And uh, I'll, I'll also talk to some of the implementation details. Um, you know, it's, it, looks, it looks easy, but it's not that easy. So, for example, you have to create uh, all of the pages in the memory yourself. Uh, well, Zen, uh, Zen hypervisor, for example, have do have APIs, so uh, but they are not very well documented. So you have to play with them, 
and you create, for example, increase reservation is one that you can use to create pages. So once you create the pages, you have to maintain all the mappings, but uh, you know, Zen provides a, a functionality to switch between different pointers. And um, uh, another very uh, important aspect of this is like, um, you know, uh, this switching between different EPTs or you can call them the memory views because essentially what you are doing is you are creating different views of, uh, of the memory. So you can present one view to one user and other view to other user and you know by user, a user can be a malware also. Uh, the, 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 the best part is that uh, the VM exit, uh, VM exit is a very uh, expensive operation. Uh, what, what by VM exit means is like when uh, you know you are running your domain on top of hypervisor and suddenly the control has to be transferred to the hypervisor. What, what that means is hypervisor has to st store all of the virtual CPUs inside that domain, the context of all those virtual CPUs and then get out and get, take the, uh, give the control to the hypervisor. But uh, switching between these EPTs, there is no VM exit. So it's very fast and I, I will explain later like why performance is very critical to uh, anything you are doing, especially building a detection system using VMI. So okay guys, so uh, once we understand the basics, uh, we started playing with an environment, right? We need to have a board to play with this whole uh, implementation. In, in our case, we didn't have a, a specific board. So we went to LinkedIn, we used Google uh, Silings, you know Silings, uh, FPGA creators. And it turns out that this guy has a pretty cool uh, board uh, which is uh, MPSOC CCU 102. The problem was that that board is $2,500, just a starter kit. So we talked to those guys, we tell them, hey, you know what, we have this project in mind and kudos to Silings, they just ship, us, ship, ship the board to our house and then uh, we started playing with, with the whole environment. So this is the board. It's just a, pre a standard uh, uh, inputs and outputs. So we have an SD card to root the root FS. We have Ethernet, UART, is JTAG, uh, and we have uh, quad core A53s that are the ARM CPUs, uh, dual core R5F. So this is the board <laughs> that is very expensive. But don't worry, the uh, what we are presenting is is can be used in the, a, any other board. So the first thing that we were learning, guys, because in, in well, I, I am a like reverser, you know, exploit related guy. This kind of board, I never played with it. It was very challenging because we are running same hypervisor on it, and there is no implementation on this board with the VMI inspection on it. So it was kind of hard for us because there is no support. So we learned that there is a P P Peta Linux project, which basically helps you to. Uh, uh, deploy the whole in, uh, uh, information into the board so that you can boot it up. It's pretty cool. The only problem is that um, it works with the specific images. So we have our own send hypervisor custom uh, deployment. So it was a problem for us. That's the first thing. Second thing is Peta Linux is for silence, right? What if tomorrow we want to deploy the same environment in Renesas, NXP, others? So we don't want to just tie to silence related stuff. So then we, we went to Jokto. You know, many of you guys know Jokto very well. Well, in my case, it was like, uh, I don't have an idea. It, it, it turns out pretty cool. Uh, the only problem was that the root FS at the end was VC box related. That was a pain in the ass for us because uh, once we have it, everything up and running, we really need Python libraries to run our machine learning stuff. And it was a pain to just compile a single library, like TensorFlow, for example, machine learning. So it was pretty cool, pretty easy to run. But at the end of the day, a VC box root FS, root FS, it was a, a pain for us. So we end up choosing dbootstrap. Dbootstrap allows you to have a root FS, in this case, ARM. 64 Debian based flavor. So you have apt get, you can download all the libraries. So it was the way for us to go. Very recommended instead of the, of the previous one. Now, in the dev environment, guys, so you don't want to push everything on the board, right? Because the board is like the production environment. So you really want to have a, a test environment. So in our case, uh, we, we pick a CH. SCHROOT, which is a wrapper for CHROOT. It's pretty cool because we have our Ubuntu Intel X64 environment, as you can see in, in the picture in the, in the bottom. So with this uh, Intel-based environment via SCHROOT, you can, you know, uh, 
using Chemo, you can CH root into the environment, you can you do your testing, install libraries, connect to internet, everything like you were in the board, but once you test everything, then you can jump into the board. It's pretty convenient for us. Uh, now, let's boot the board, right? So what do we need to boot the board? Silence has a specific uh, debugger, which is called Silence System Debugger Client. What it basically does, it reads a TCL file. That TCL file, just you guys to have an idea, what basically is doing is going to boot four different files. The PNUFW, which is just to set up the, pro the clock and the platform management on, on the board. Then the, the first uh, stage boot loader, which is going to initialize U-boot. And then U-boot, which is going to allow us to boot the hypervisor, in this case, same hypervisor, then the Linux kernel, and finally the rootFS, uh, and the BL31, which is ARM trusted firmware. We didn't play with these components. Uh, we just used them with the versions of Silings. Important to mention that if you combine versions, uh, it will never boot the board. So we have a lot of pain uh, trying to play with different versions, and it was not booting. So once you reach uh, this initial stage of JTAG, you get into the U-boot prompt. And now let's boot the board, right? So the first thing is, you know the data device tree blob. Uh, that's where all the configuration from the board is, is located. So the first thing is the root uh, location, right? Where is your root FS uh, that you want to boot on? In our case, it's an SD card partition, as you can see there. Then the second thing is uh, we have our same hypervisor. We just convert it into U-boot format with that command line. And then you start booting up the system. You know, this is the typical U-boot uh, commands. So the first thing is U-boot. Uh, the send DTB, which is the device tree blob in a specific uh, location. Then you boot the, uh, the Linux kernel. That Linux kernel, you see the 80,000 address. That address must be exactly the same address that you have in the DTB. Otherwise, when it is booting up, it doesn't, it's not going to find the Linux kernel address, and therefore it's not, it's not going to boot. And then you load the same hypervisor, and finally you run the boot M, which is basically telling you, okay, so boot the board uh, in the address, you know, 140, uh, 100,000, which is uh, the same hypervisor. Then the hyphen in the middle is telling that you need to grab the rootFS direct uh, path from the DTB. And finally, you have a, a, the same DTB. With this, uh, we can boot it to the board. This, take, this same uh, specific steps, guys, for us, uh, it took us many days and months because it was a lot of issues putting the send hypervisor. Uh, another important point here, guys, is that those addresses that you see there loading, if you don't have enough space between them, they are going to overlap, and then your board is going to crash. So suddenly we were just you know, booting up. It was crashing. And turns out that uh, you need to have enough space for every single memory address, but there is no validation on it. So you need to make sure that whatever the same hypervisor is loaded in memory, the Linux kernel, that has enough space so that you don't overlap. Uh, and you don't, uh, you know, you, you, you don't get a kernel panic or or same hypervisor problem. Okay, so let's get the damn syscalls out, huh? Uh, basically, um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's it was uh, it was kind of a, almost became a dream for us to see this arm syscalls. <laughs> on the screen because you know we've been going back and forth we tried different things we always get got stuck because you know as i said it's not very well documented and you know uh, there are few research papers out there so we were like just trying different things playing with the memory and finally you know uh, we figured out um, or we did our own implementation so uh, as you guys remember i was i was mentioning about why single stepping and you know this why single stepping is very important and why you know we we've been we're going to use the uh, known cpu assisted single stepping uh, the reason is like uh, since we were using the zen hypervisor and zen hypervisor does not support single stepping on arm so we have to figure out our own way of doing what normally a cpu does and uh, we found a, a very interesting paper online. Uh, we talked to that guy also, Sergey from Germany. Uh, so, and then we reviewed some other techniques online, and we finally uh, decided to use this technique. It's it's a very fascinating fascinating one. Uh, so remember, EPT helps you create different views of the memory, right? And so first, the first step is uh, basically you create two views of the memory. By views, I mean like um, you just take the whole memory take all the pages, you create the copy of those pages, 
and then you know you have these two copies in your memory uh, for those pages and then uh, since Zen hypervisor provides this support to have multiple EPT so you point one EPT you know let's just call one view default view and the other the single stepping view so you have two EPTs now uh, one is the default view default view is the one where you know you'll you, you, you're gonna run de by default when the system starts that is the view where you're gonna the control will be and the execution will happen and then you have another view in the memory waiting uh, if you want to switch to that one so we have these two views and uh, i'm talking uh, remember i'm now i'm talking in context of the the sys calls so the goal is to uh, start monitoring the arm sys calls um, or the operating system system calls on an arm platform right so so think of it like okay you want to monitor a particular system call it the code is in in the memory somewhere so you find the location of that mem uh, uh, that that api uh, in the memory so you for the uh, at the first instruction you put uh, one breakpoint and on arm is uh, oh sorry so on arm uh, the breakpoint is this uh, d40003 it's also called smc it's an in special instruction on Intel. It's int three, so uh, you can use the same for Intel also. But you don't have to use the, the this one for Intel. Uh, just to mention that because uh, Zen actually supports uh, single stepping on Intel, so you can just use that one. Um, so on the f the first instruction, uh, you put one breakpoint in the default view, and then um, on the second instruction, you put another breakpoint but in the single stepping view. Now what will happen? Uh, in the, the control is in the default view and uh, you know you just uh, once the first breakpoint hits uh, what you do is you do your analysis you want to get the syscall you know you note down all the parameters what process call the syscall whatever analysis you want to do right and then you know you switch the view. You switch the view and the control will go to the instruction one in the second view the instruction one will get executed and then the second breakpoint will hit. When the second breakpoint hits again you get the control you switch back to the default view and then the second instruction gets executed. So basically that's how you single step uh, on ARM if you're using the Zen hypervisor and not many hypervisors support ARM so Zen is probably your best choice on, on, or unless you want to uh, build your own hypervisor from scratch that is an option too. So uh, this technique is, is very fascinating and, and you know as I was saying this is one of the applications of the views that the underlying architecture uh, provides through vir uh, the virtualization extensions. So that's how we, we single step uh, on ARM in our implementation. Um, so let's take a look overall how do you now um, as a detection or as a monitoring system using VMI how do you monitor from the outside right so using all the concept that we have uh, so far shared right so what you will do is um, uh, first of all you will um, put a hook on any every function or every API uh, in the memory that you want to really analyze or for example you might want to always uh, analyze sleep because malware use sleep a lot. Um, so the first step is to uh, put that breakpoint, go to that memory location and put that instruction uh, and in combination you have to register an event. Now a good hypervisor always provides a event mechanism, right? So you, you wanna, you wanna monitor something, it provides you an event mechanism and Zen does the same. So you register your event and then you also register your callback. So that's the second most important because with the callback function that you're gonna register, what it does is you're telling the hypervisor, hey, anytime my breakpoint hit, you you know give me the control and execute this function. So in this function you're gonna do everything. For example, you're gonna extract once the breakpoint hits, you're gonna extract the parameter values of the function, you know, the function name, process name, or whatever you wanna do, you do in this function. The single stepping functionality that I showed you um, in the previous slide, you will also do in this function. So that's the second uh, most important step. Uh, the third step is obviously, you know, you need to single step. Remember, so if you don't single step, what will happen? Uh, the breakpoint will hit, you don't single step, the control will stay there, it will continue to execute the same instruction, the system will get into a very unstable state and, you know, imagine you are protecting a car 
infotainment and then you will you will crash the system so it's very important to make sure you know you properly single step and finally you know once you're done monitoring uh, make sure you remove all your hooks from the memory and uh, you know you you know you do a very clean exit so that's how you basically um, do uh, the syscall monitoring through vmi and uh, on arm especially it was challenging because uh, you know as i mentioned there was no single stepping and there was no documentation so it took us some time but you know finally we are very happy that you know we achieved this so let me let me now show you how it looks like uh, our moment of uh, happiness when we first saw this so i hope it okay so how do i show uh, click escape in the okay escape escape the presentation And then, yeah. So this is our Xilinx board. Uh, we have our introspection framework. We call it Newman introspection framework. And um, uh, yeah, these are this is how the syscall looks like. You know the process name and everything. Uh, now see, you know we are typing, and then you see all the syscalls being log uh, logged on the upper right. And then now I type top. And then you can see the process name top being tracked. This is happening, everything happening from the raw memory outside the operating system. So that's pretty cool. And now finally, you know, we do a we do a sleep, and then uh, you're gonna see the sleep being uh, shown. And not only shown because we have other components, uh, it's it's also being monitored as I highlighted here. So uh, not only we get these syscalls out, we also uh, send it to our machine learning model to to monitor it. So. That was our. Uh, it took us quite some time to achieve that one, and yeah, that was the. Okay, guys. So let's get to the fun part because uh, uh, after this whole efforts, as you can see, now we know the basics. We know how to arm uh, use uh, BMI to introspect into the machine learning. Uh, sorry, into the machine. Uh, now we, we are able to have the board everything, right? Now let's see what we can do uh, from a tax perspective and detection with these components uh, in, in the board, right? So the first approach is a typical malware uh, coming into a car, into a medical device, right? How can we tackle that problem from BMI? So if you have been working on uh, antivirus companies or sandbox related companies, is, is the typical way to do it is very common. But keep in mind here, guys, we are out of the box. We don't have an agent inside, and, and that's a totally different, different beast. So uh, let's see the first example. For example, uh, we have a, a, ma a malware running. So what we do in this specific scenario is we, we're going to use machine learning in order to detect attacks. So what we do is we get, let's say, the infotainment from the car, and we profile it. We get all the processes running. We feed it into, into our uh, autoencoder, which is neural network-based uh, uh, approach. And, and what it's going to do is it's going to learn how a, healthy system, how a healthy system looks like, all the processes, all the different syscalls being executed. So once it learns that, uh, when, we, when it is running a process in the infotainment, it's going to grab that profile, which is in the left side, the actual profile. That is going to be fit into the autoencoder. And then he, the autoencoder is going to create a new profile based on his learning experience. Once it's generated, if the similarity between the reconstructed profile and the and the, and the actual profile that was running in the in the in the device is is has really low error, which means is very similar, is when we know we are dealing with a benign process. But what what happens when we have a malicious process? So the same process happens. We have this malicious process. We profile it and we create the actual profile, feed it into the other encoder. The other encoder is going to create his own reconstruction of the profile, and it's going to realize that the sequence and the syscalls being used is totally off. Is the error level is really really high, and that way is easy for us with, via machine learning to detect that there is an anomaly inside the device. Uh, that's a uh, pretty simple uh, step one. Second approach, guys. Let's say that we have a, an exploit going on, right? Uh, in the left side, you can see an application running and the list of all the syscalls going on there. So you are going to see always the way it executes. 
But what happens if suddenly that application is compromised? So if you, if you see in the right side, uh, uh, at the end in the in the red uh, uh, bot in the red square, uh, you will see that comparing the two applications, the benign one without being exploited is going to exit the program. But when you look at the second one, it's going to call execp. Why execp? Obviously, because it's gaining a shell. So in this case, we don't need we don't really need machine learning to realize that the flow has been affected, right? We call it sequence based. People call it control flow. Same as H. SHIT. So at the end of the day, uh, you just need to measure the sequence based and realize if there is any alteration. And in this case, one exit properly and the second one called execp, so it's easy to detect. Uh, now let's talk about the delay. Uh, you, if you guys are familiar with antivirus and, uh, and sandboxes, right? And one of the techniques of, of, of the APTs, for example, is to delay execution so that it executes and then it's going to wait for execution so that an antivirus needs to take a decision in milliseconds to know if it is malicious or not, right? It, doesn't, it cannot be scanning the process all the time. So by delaying the execution, those engines are going to give up and they are going to stop monitoring it, and that's a way to bypass it. So that scenario is a pain always in the, in, in, in the enterprise with antivirus. In our case, it's the same issue, but how we tackle it uh, comparing with them. So in our case, for example, we have this pretty simple delay in ARM, and it's just a simple loop that is going to you know, delay execution for eight seconds, eight minutes, and then after that, it's going to trigger the shell. If you remember the previous slide, in that one, we have all the execution. At, at the end, we have the exec B to be called. In this case, what happened is that the exec B is, is never going to be called, and therefore, we're not going to see any anomaly. So that's a pretty, pretty challenge, ch challenge that people have. So what the people do, for example, in the sandboxes, they hook all this sleep or nano sleep or those syscalls. And once they see this syscall triggering, let's say that in, there is an sleep for five minutes, they will change at runtime the five minutes to zero so that they force the malware to execute, right? That's one technique, but that is a cat and mouse game because today is sleep, tomorrow is nano sleep, and there's going to be multiple techniques all the time. So you need to keep updating these techniques so that anytime there is a new way to bypass it, you need to update it. Uh, in this case, for example, we don't even use an sleep. Uh, we don't use a syscall. So in this case, it's just a code that's going to delay execution. So you, don't, you cannot rely on hooking syscall. So uh, this is a, a challenge for everyone. In our case, uh, we tackle it in a different way. Uh, one way is you don't want to uh, monitor these executions all the time, right? We were talking about we are in a car. We don't want to delay execution. Can you imagine the GPS just slowing down or any application in the car? So we need to decide quickly. But if this application is running and it's sleeping, we cannot wait forever. So we have a way to tag the process so that when the process starts running, suddenly it goes to sleep. We stop executing, and then we monitor it in a way that uh, we can uh, uh, know when the, the malware wakes up. Uh, there is a way to do it via profile-based uh, approach that Ali is going to explain in a second. But from BMI perspective, uh, same challenge, but we don't want to follow the syscall implementation in order to understand when there is a delay. In our case, we tag it, the process. We just, you are sleeping, we sleep. We don't do any performance issue. But as soon as you wake up, we wake up. So that's a profile-based uh, policy that we're going to explain in a second. Now, Ali was explaining us that his technique, right? Uh, the, sorry, the technique that he was explaining to hook into the memory. So he was telling us that, you know, you need to put a D40003 as an MC hook, right? So that's pretty cool, uh, uh, but it's pretty easy to bypass. So, uh, I mean, uh, if I have a kernel module, I can just go to the syscall, grab the first four bytes, and then get the, 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 the SMC there. And for me as a malware, I'm going to be able to detect right away that I'm being monitored, right? And that moment, I'm going to say, you know what, man? I have this SMB hook. I'm being monitored, so I'm not going to execute anything. I want to wipe the system or even worse. I can overwrite, if, if the memory uh, the page allow me, I can overwrite that SMC hook to, the, to put it in the, in the original state, and then I can just totally bypass the hooks in the system, and then this whole technique being shown by Ali is totally screwed, because it's pretty easy to identify, so I don't know how come Ali come up with this technique, but anyways. <laughs> okay. okay, so let me think how we can 
uh, answer Dan. So you remember the views, right? And I keep saying the views are very powerful. So here's another use case, and we'll we'll see how we can uh, answer Dan's question. Um, in this case, what we are doing is again we are creating uh, you know two views. Actually, you know you don't need to create. Um, uh, the the whole the whole memory pages. What what we are essentially doing is, we are um, assigning different permissions to different uh, EPTs. So we have two EPTs. Uh, one is going to be the execute only. The other is going to be the read write only. Now what will happen? So let's say by default we are in the execute only view, right? And the malware comes and tries to read the hooks that we have placed in the memory. Um, since the page is execute only, there will be an exception. The control will be transferred to me. And I will see that the malware is trying to be smart. So what I will do is I will switch the view, uh, which is the clean view by the way. There is no hooks, hook, hook in, uh, in this view. So that's the, that's the trick. So I have this view where there is no hook. I will I'll switch the view. I will let the malware read the memory pages in this view and then its uh, read request will be satisfied. The malware will not know, you know, that there are any hooks or it's being monitored. So that's how. And then once the, the that read request is done, uh, we'll switch back to the execute view. So you saw the previous application where you know we created these views uh, to do the single stepping. Now you saw another one where you know we use the same capability that you know the Intel and the ARM provides to. Uh, bypass uh, or trying, uh, you know, malware detecting us, uh, we bypass that. Okay, guys, so let's see another uh, other examples. Um, uh, in this case, we have an anti VMM. You know, hypervisors are known to be virtual machine monitors, is another name. So, what we have here is uh, I'm again, I'm a malware, right? So, I want to know if I'm being monitored. If I'm, in, I'm, I'm being monitored, so I'm going to stop executing. So in this case, uh, since we are switching views, as we explained, that has a cost, has a time in, in terms of performance. So what a malware can do, uh, and we do, we just do a proof of concept here, is we measure as a baseline with a ha without having the page view switching. We just measure the time. In this case, it's 38 nanoseconds, and then. Once we do that, we now measure the time that it takes to write into the memory. And you will see in that red uh, color uh, that the time is highly significant so that you will realize that uh, the time to write into memory is totally different to the baseline. And this is another technique that we can use to detect that we are being monitored. Just by measuring the time that it takes to write into memory, we can realize it's taking too much time at the baseline. And, and, and this is a, another way to to find a, a way to bypass, uh, to, to understand that we are being monitored. Now, uh, let's talk about process killing, guys. So when we, when we kill a process, right, uh, we all know how it works, right? Uh, uh, if you want to implement it on, on code, you will just need to call the syscall kill, and you pass the PID and the way you want to kill it, right? Dash 9 if you want to force it. So that's the way it works normally in a user mode scenario, and we all know. But what happened here is uh, what happened if we want to implement a simple killing process in BMI? Keep in mind that we don't have any agent inside. So people or other companies, what, uh, what they do is they just drop an agent inside. They call kill in the user mode, and then you just kill the process. But in our case, guys, we don't have a, an agent inside, and, and we don't want to have an agent inside. We want to keep being out of the box. So how a simple kill process can be done from BMI? So we have a way to do it here. Uh, it doesn't need to be the perfect solution, but the idea here is that you guys can see the challenge when you want to just kill a simple process that is very easy to do, but from the hypervisor. So what we do is, let's say that we want to kill the process ID 300. So what we do is in the kernel, because this whole BMI, guys, is being executed in the kernel. We are not using user mode syscalls because it's too high, too consuming. It's a lot of performance issues. So we are just hooking in the kernel. So when these 300 
other process is running, what we are going to do from BMI is we are going to monitor all the syscalls. So when the syscalls come in from that process, what we are going to do is we are going to mess with the stack. That uh, information that you see in the green is the full stack dumped from, a, from, all the, from one syscall. So what we do is, you know, there is something that, that is called a safe user state registers. So when you transfer from user mode to kernel mode, those registers in user mode are stored in the kernel so that when the kernel resumes execution in user mode, those registers are used again, right? So what we do in kernel is that we get that stack content, we get those safe registers which are not being used by the kernel, and we just nullify them. What, what's going to happen, guys, is that when the syscalls come back into the user mode, since those registers are totally nullified, it's going to cause an exception and it's going to exit the process. As you can see, it's totally a different way. It's, it's not a traditional one, but taking advantage of VMI, we are able to mess up with the stack and then force the process to kill. Important to mention that uh, it's not easy to do because uh, in this example, you see the yellow box. Uh, if you mess with any kernel related information, which is in the lower addresses, you're going to get a crash in the, in the device. So you want to make sure that you are really uh, overriding only uh, the user mode uh, register information. So we learned that from experience, and then we come up with this specific offset that is calculated dynamically so that we always overwrite only uh, user mode registers. Uh, and the way it works, guys, is that every time we get a, we said to the, to the device, hey, kill PID 300, it's going to grab all the syscalls. Every time we grab it, it's going to mess up with the stack. Sometimes in the first syscall, it, 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 it gets the exception and kills it. Som sometimes in the second and the third one. So sometimes it, 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 sometimes it needs to take like five or seven syscalls to be called in order to, in order to be killed. But this simple example, guys, as I said, uh, is totally different beast, as you can see. It's not, it's not easy to do it at, at the VMI if you want to be totally alienless. So let's see uh, a quick example of, of, of uh, how we kill it. Uh, in, 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 uh, in the device. So here we have our, our uh, system. So what we're going to do, guys, in, guys, is in the upper left, uh, we're going to run a simple uh, malware like Mirai, which is a very, uh, very common one. In the upper right, we have our inspector monitoring it. Here is the Mirai. We're going to execute it. As soon as we execute it, Mirai delays itself and spawns a busy box process, uh, pretending to be normal, uh, and it is in the 336 PID. So let's go back to the virtual machine that we're monitoring. We search for that process, 336, and we can see that it is there running, right? 336 is there. We click on it, and then we can see that the VC box is, is showing up, right? There is VC box. Now, let's try to kill it from BMI. So we go to our uh, front end. We go and try to find the 336 process. We found it there. And then we click on kill button. That's going to be from BMI sending a, a, a signal to kill it. So then we go back to the VM and search for the Mirai, which is gone already. You know, it disappeared, as, as we said. And now let's search for the 336. And you can see that it's totally uh, killed. Uh, this uh, is totally... Uh, uh, clean, we don't crash the system, and this way to do it, which is not the best way, uh, it, it works for us, uh, uh, and that way we are able to kill from VMI perspective. Okay. Okay, so, so um, just want to quickly mention that you know once you get hold of VMI, you understand it. Uh, it's pretty cool, and you can do a lot of other things um, uh, with it. Um, it's very powerful. So um, one of the things that we did additional in addition to detection is the policy. So not only um, you can do the detection with VMI, but you can also implement policies. Again, not putting anything inside the operating system and still maintain these policies. One of the example that I want to quickly share with you is. Uh, a lot of uh, infotainment, or so any IoT device, for example, medical device, there are certain processes very limited which are responsible for going out to the internet. So what you can do is you can, you know, the task list that I showed you, you can continuously monitor that from the outside and, and you know, since socket is a special file, you can just simply see if there is another uh, socket being opened. That might be slow because you're actively uh, traversing. Uh, uh, alternatively, what you can do is you can hook a connect 
or a, a network API and then you know when when the, that API gets called you will see if this process is allowed to communicate outside or not. So here is you know just a quick uh, view of um, how it uh, it looks like in our system. Uh, like Dan was mentioning, uh, remediation is another uh, topic that we are tackling. Aspect: once we detect something, we need to kill. It's not easy to kill from outside. We always have that option to put an agent inside, but we don't want to do that. We want to be totally out of the box. So you want to try. I mean, the method that we showed you is not one of the. I mean, we we figured that out on our own, but we we have another one. You know. That's that's that we're exploring right now. So you can try different things. You can make the parameters null and try try th some of those things. Quickly, want to share some of the recommendations with you guys for an end-to-end -end system. Let's say you're working with some other hypervisor, like in our case, you know, Zen is just the start. We are already working with some, you know, another hypervisor, um, and that's a custom one. So you really need to have good way of putting the breakpoints, efficient single stepping mechanism, uh, the event mechanism. Now we didn't talk too much about event mechanism because Zen provides a really good event mechanism. But if you're working with some other hypervisor, you want to make sure you know you have a good event mechanism. Anything that you translate using those page, 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 page tables or the page walk, uh, you know, you want to make sure uh, you cache those in an efficient hash tables. Uh, multiple views is awesome, as you can see. I mean, we have few other use cases which are patent pending. We cannot talk about it. Uh, we combine the views uh, in, you know, with other techniques uh, to really, really improve the performance. And VMI in VMI monitoring system, performance is the key. And finally, the permission management. Uh, Finally, guys, uh, we are releasing some uh, tools uh, for you guys to play with. Um, you can see the the Dropbox. You can go and check them out. So we have the ARM and Intel VMI monitoring tools that you know you can play with. Um, uh, we have all the files that we have used to you know uh, boot up the Xilinx board. And finally, we have the uh, one malware ARM 64 based malware that you can use to do an end to end scenario. So do check that out and and uh, you know play with it. Uh, okay, so finally, the the takeaways uh, in today's ad world of advanced malware, we really need to make sure you know we make the hypervisor smart. Hypervisor is everywhere, so you know you want to make sure you know you you make it smart, and uh, you know agentless is the way to go because we know that you know anytime you have an agent inside, it's it's a it's a losing game. ARM syscall monitoring is obviously was a great achievement for us, but it's just the start. I mean, we there's a, now there's a lot we can do. So don't just stop at the you know syscall monitoring. You know, think of new use cases, and you know, especially switching between views is very powerful. So you can also think of new use cases around that. And finally, performance is the key. We have a patent pending Newman adaptive uh, monitoring, and then we 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 use that um, uh, in our system. We cannot talk about it right now. We need another talk for that. Okay, finally, I really want to thank um, uh, Sake, Matt, Stefano, Walid. I don't know if you guys are here, uh, but still, uh, these guys really helped us along our, our, uh, our, our journey, and um, it wouldn't have been possible what we have achieved without these guys. So, thank you guys. Thank you.